Well, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. On behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations, I would like to welcome the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, to today's conversation. I'm Daniel Speckard, the president of Chorus International, and will be presiding for today's discussion. We are joined by council members here in Washington and virtually, and the prime minister is in town for a meeting of heads of state and government uh, for the NATO anniversary summit for its 75th anniversary year. In introducing the prime minister, I won't repeat your bio, which you all have, uh, but I would add that he has carved an impressive path in Greek politics and in navigating his country through a very challenging time in European security and in the world. When I first met him 15 years ago, I was ambassador to Greece and he was a young parliamentarian that had already caught the attention of the United States and other diplomats as a member of parliament who was coloring outside the traditional uh, political Greek lines and promoting good governance and an evidence-based approach to public policy. He represents a new generation of leaders in a world that is fundamentally led by an older generation and has successfully done what few others have been able to do, and that is to hold the political center in an increasingly politicized and populist world. We are fortunate to have him here today with Greece at the crossroads of Europe and a maritime country with global reach it has a long tradition of worrying and recognizing the importance about security in the world and punching up above its weight on international issues. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for having me. Well, let me kick it off today by asking you about what's on top of everyone's mind, and that's Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure there'll be new pledges. I've been a NATO official and worked many of these summits in the past on the staff side, and I know they're going to come up with some great announcements, great pledges, new signs of support for Ukraine. But as the war drags on into its third year, I know also fatigue is starting to set in, and there's a sense of malaise amongst uh, many, and that perhaps Putin's strategy of waiting out the West is starting to bear fruit. How do you see the current situation evolving in the coming year? And what impact, if any, do you think this summit is going to have? And perhaps you could also say what implications for European security uh, there will be if Putin feels that he can once again annex territory by the use of force. Well, first of all, let me speak about uh, Greece and then about uh, Europe in terms of how we see this conflict uh, uh, evolving Greece, from the very beginning, uh, positioned uh, uh, itself uh, in line with uh, our allies and in full support of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, this was not necessarily a given for a country that has had uh, historical, cultural, and religious ties uh, to Russia. But we made our position very, very clear. Uh, and I think we have uh, delivered in terms of uh, um, political, economic, but also military uh, support and our position is not going to change. I also need to point out that uh, the European Union, in spite of what many predicted at the beginning of this war, has been remarkably united uh, when it comes to um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, we uh, um, uh, have uh, imposed the numerous rounds uh, uh, of uh, sanctions on Ukraine. And we were actually the ones that uh, delivered on a significant uh, package of uh, fiscal support uh, before um, the U.S. agreed on its uh, uh, support, uh, pledging to continue to support Ukraine for as long uh, as it takes, both financially and militarily. And of course, when it comes to uh, offering uh, Ukraine uh, EU membership perspective, we've also crossed uh, that bridge uh, and the first uh, uh, intergovernmental discussions, uh, uh, which mark the beginning of this long path towards European membership uh, has uh, started uh, this month. So I don't uh, see any signs uh, of uh, the European commitment uh, towards supporting um, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, wavering. Yes, we may have problems with, uh, uh, with one or two um, uh, countries. One of them happens to be leading the European uh, Council uh, as we speak. Uh, but uh, overall, 
the support of Europe has been uh, very robust. And uh, the Ukrainian crisis has also forced us uh, to acknowledge uh, a fact uh, which uh, uh, has been painfully obvious to some of us, but not to all of my European colleagues, and that is that we need to take more ownership when it comes to issues uh, uh, of European defense and European strategic autonomy, which also brings us to the question of, uh, of NATO and uh, this uh, important summit that is taking place in, uh, in Washington. Uh, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, has been right in terms of pointing the finger uh, at some uh, uh, European countries, some of them being very large in terms of not stepping up to the plate and delivering when it came to their commitments towards NATO. Now, I, I do need to point out that Greece is not in that category uh, because Greece has been spending more than 2% of its GDP ever since it uh, uh, joined uh, NATO. But as we uh, recognize that we need to take more ownership when it comes to issues of European security. Inevitably, we in Europe are also spending more uh, in terms of our uh, defense uh, commitments. And of course, this brings us to the question of whether we can do more at the European level um, to organize our security to complement what NATO uh, is doing. I believe, again, the answer needs to be uh, affirmative. I have uh, proposed uh, with my good friend, the Polish uh, Prime Minister, uh, a, a European uh, defense uh, initiative, which is essentially a European uh, Iron Dome. So how do we complement and strengthen uh, our existing uh, anti-air defense capabilities by committing more European resources um, to this project, always fully integrated with uh, NATO command and control structures. Uh, but this, for us, uh, is going to become uh, a topic which we will focus more and more uh, on as we move into the next European cycle. Do you feel that what you're describing there is going to be enough to kind of stabilize the situation in Europe? And um, I'm thinking uh, here whether we can look to a brighter future or whether or not we could uh, expect further trouble uh, as the Russians perhaps uh, and what is hopefully their conflict there at some point in the future, they'll look to places like the Balkans or the Mediterranean uh, or the Middle East. Uh, what's your sense of the, perhaps the stability in the wider European region and whether or not uh, NATO is really up to the task of even going beyond just managing the Ukraine crisis, but managing what could be larger crises in the region? Well, Ukraine is the number one uh, priority. And of course, uh, we are all um, uh, realists. And I think the, the message that also came out of the, you know, the peace conference that took place in Switzerland was that the continuous support to Ukraine uh, is important because whatever peace discussions take place at some point, they cannot be um, uh, uh, under conditions where Ukraine is defeated and capitulates. This is not an acceptable um, premise. Um, for us in, uh, in Europe. And of course, this means um, patience uh, and, and continued support uh, to, um, uh, to Ukraine uh, uh, and to make sure that uh, there, are, there is no drastic change when it comes to, um, to, the, to the battlefield, at least um, uh, putting Ukraine in a, uh, in a position of uh, significant uh, uh, disadvantage. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't, again, let me repeat, I do not sense that there's anyone in Europe who does not believe that this is right now, I mean, the right short-term, I stress short-term, uh, approach to uh, address uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue. Now, in terms of the remaining uh, important uh, uh, strategic um, uh, priorities, uh, Greece sits on the you know, southeastern um, the flank of, um, uh, of NATO. Uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we're facing our own you know, sets of challenges uh, in the region, in particular uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. But I think what is important is that we should try uh, our best to ensure that we don't have additional problems that compound what is already a very complicated uh, situation when it comes to Ukraine. As far as our relationship with Turkey uh, is uh, concerned, uh, when we first um, came uh, into office in 2019, we faced um, a situation of, uh, of what I call sort of aggressive Turkish revisionism. And we went through 
uh, three years of difficult times um, with, uh, with Turkey. Over the past year, uh, I'd say year and a half, um, things have significantly uh, improved. Uh, uh, and I think we should um, uh, acknowledge that, while at the same time uh, recognizing that some of the fundamental Turkish positions uh, when it comes to the situation uh, in the Eastern Med have not profoundly changed. But the fact that we've had you know, 16 months of, you know, of quiet in terms of having no violations of Greek airspace, that we're working better together when it comes to issues of migration, that we've actually uh, done a, a deal with, uh, uh, with Turkey that allows Turkish citizens to travel to the islands, the Greek uh, the islands of the... Uh, of the Aegean uh, uh, and get their visa uh, very, very quickly, encouraging Turkish visitors to come to Greece. All these are some positive steps that at least point to a situation of detente. And in its own right, at a time when we're faced with significant challenges um, uh, within uh, NATO, uh, this is something which uh, I think moves the needle um, in the positive uh, direction when it comes to uh, our relations. Now, the Balkans, as you know, uh, are much more uh, complicated. And Greece has always been uh, you know, very supportive uh, uh, of uh, the European perspective uh, of the six Western Balkan um, uh, countries. And uh, in that uh, respect, uh, we have been consistent uh, in our policy. But the problem with, uh, with the Balkans is that quite frequently sort of the the ghosts of nationalism uh, sort of emerge when you don't necessarily uh, expect them. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, North Macedonia. Uh, North Macedonia is a member of NATO uh, today because uh, uh, Greece uh, lifted uh, its, uh, its veto after the Prespos Agreement, uh, which was uh, signed and ratified by the previous government. I've had you know, issues with the Prespos Agreement, but I've made it very clear that this is an international agreement that, that binds the country. And I respected it, and I, and I do respect it. But one of the fundamental tenets, if not the most fundamental aspect of the Prespos Agreement, uh, had to do with the name North Macedonia being used, erga omnes, which means both internally within North Macedonia and externally. Uh, and this is something which is simply non-negotiable. It's very clear, it's in the Prespos Agreement, and it's non-negotiable for Greece. So when I hear the new um, um, uh, government of North Macedonia referring to the country as Republic of Macedonia uh, uh, within the country, I have serious concerns. Uh, and uh, this is an issue which I do intend uh, to raise. It is not constructive, it does not help uh, the European path uh, of uh, North Macedonia. It's, a, it's an unnecessary uh, complexity uh, at a time when we should be looking for areas of, uh, uh, of conversion. So it's just one example how you know, the situation of the Balkans can always be yeah. um, uh, uh, complicated, but Greece is a country that remains a, a pillar of stability uh, in, the, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, a country that has left sort of behind it the most difficult years of the financial uh, crisis with an economy that is growing significantly faster than the rest of the Eurozone, and again, uh, ready to play an active and constructive role uh, in promoting uh, political stability, but also economic prosperity uh, in the Balkans. Well, I know from my own experience that you deserve a lot of credit for uh, that detente in uh, relations with uh, Turkey. Uh, and it takes a lot of political uh, courage and will to reset those relations sometimes when they're not on the right track. And I know you took, personally took steps to do that. So you deserve a lot of credit in trying to keep uh, security in the southern uh, and southeastern flank of NATO. Um, let's talk a little bit more globally. I mentioned uh, Greece is a seafaring country and uh, has a global reach around the world. Uh, on the NATO agenda is the issue of uh, global partnerships, Indo-Pacific partnerships in particular, that of Japan, Australia, uh, South Korea. Um, and 
I know that 40% of trade goes through South China Sea, uh, and as we watch that dynamic play out there, it's not out of the realm of possibility that that could become a more troublesome place and affect global trade. How do you see uh, the conversation going uh, here in Washington on the role of China and that it's playing, particularly as it's also uh, not just in the South China Sea being a little more aggressive, but it's providing dual-use technology to Russia uh, that's affecting the Ukraine war. What's the conversation going to be like around China? And what are your thoughts and views uh, on how those interactions should be taking place with that country on the global security stage? Well, first stage? of all, we've had these discussions at the European Council. And this is a complicated relationship uh, uh, with, with China, which can be at times you know, uh, a rival, an adversary. It, it could and should be a partner on issues such as um, uh, climate change. Uh, but of course, uh, one is right to point out that uh, all the big security issues are in a way uh, interconnected. And what happens in the Indo-Pacific is uh, uh, of, uh, of great concern uh, to us, uh, not just as a European country, you're right to point out that Greece is a country that plays a critical role in, um, uh, in, uh, in global shipping. One should not forget that more than 80% of, of global trade um, uh, is, uh, is trade related to shipping, and that Greece controls 25% of the global um, uh, uh, maritime fleet. So we have a profound interest uh, in ensuring freedom uh, of navigation and ensuring that uh, um, uh, trade routes uh, uh, remain open and that global trade continues to, uh, to flow. And, uh, and especially at a time when you know, trade is becoming a more uh, complicated uh, uh, pol political uh, issue, you know, Greece is a country that remains in principle uh, committed uh, to, uh, to free trade. And you know, sometimes we see uh, the, the implications uh, uh, when you have uh, you know bottlenecks or problems when it comes to to trade routes, look at what's happening. For example, now closer to our home in the Red Sea, where we actually have an upper, when we actually have ships. We have a ship that just shot down, you know, yesterday shot down, you know, Houthi drones uh, that were threatening uh, maritime um, uh, vessels. Uh, and of course, at a time when uh, uh, the cost of living and inflation is a concern to us, any disruption. Uh, in, uh, in trade inevitably contributes towards prices moving in the, uh, in the wrong direction and, um, uh, and, and going up. Uh, so, uh, uh, and of course, let me add to that the, the fact that uh, uh, issues uh, um, um, uh, and discussions in, uh, in Europe about critical uh, uh, dependencies uh, are you know, uh, gaining steam at a time when uh, we're looking at you know how dependent we uh, we, we can uh, you know we were historically uh, on China and what does this mean for our own security uh, uh, of supply and what uh, alternatives we can uh, we can have uh, these are complicated discussions uh, and let me just add one, one one final point you know there's one uh, country which is particularly important uh, I think for Greece but also for Europe uh, uh, as a whole and that is India uh, I visited uh, uh, India on an official state visit um, uh, in, in February. Um, this idea of this uh, uh, in the Middle, uh, Middle East Europe uh, corridor is a, a long-term, very powerful uh, concept when it comes to um, uh, sort of global trade in Greece. It tends to play uh, an important role as the natural entry point uh, into the European uh, Union um, uh, if this corridor uh, you know, ends up becoming from what is currently a grand vision uh, a, uh, a reality. And we're looking at you know, those infrastructure projects that can help us facilitate play that role. If you just look at the position of Greek, Greece on the, uh, on the map, we are a natural supply chain and logistics um, um, uh, country. We had not invested in this um, significantly, but now it's, it's really um, uh, taking off. And we're not just talking about goods, we're talking about energy. Uh, we are uh, currently in the process of uh, putting a floating storage and regasification unit into operation in northeastern Greece, which will allow us to import more LNG, including uh, American LNG. We have the capacity to be uh, a provider of energy security to the Balkans, you know, coming back to 
breaking the dependency of, uh, of these countries' uh, historical dependency on Russian gas. But we are currently, for those of you who don't know that, um, selling gas to Ukraine. Hmm. So, um, uh, Can I, I, I ask you just a little follow-up here, though? You also, uh, uh, on the economic side, have pretty strong uh, engagement with China. Uh, and as you create uh, some of these alternative routes <laughs> that are going to be good for security as well, for instance, the port of Piraeus is owned two-thirds by the Chinese, which is, I think, the seventh largest port in the world, providing container goods to Europe and stuff. How do you see that the dynamic of, on one hand, China being a little bit more aggressive on the security front, but at the same time, its economic uh, engagement and investment in European countries like your own uh, create, perhaps, uh, potential conflicts of interest? Yeah. Uh, this is a question I get quite frequently when I visit to the US, and I do need to point out that uh, <laughs> the investment uh, of Costco into the port of Piraeus uh, was made at a time when no one was interested to, in investing in, in Greece uh, during the height of the financial um, uh, crisis. Uh, it is a management agreement uh, uh, of, uh, of the port. Yes, the port has done uh, well over the, uh, over, over the past years, but it's not the only port um, uh, in, in Greece. Um, uh, we're currently uh, privatizing uh, many other ports, um, uh, for example, the second largest port, uh, Igumenitsa or Iraklion, these are two ports which were actually acquired by a big Italian consortium. And if you look at the footprint of foreign direct investment into Greece for the past five years, the Chinese have essentially been non-present. Uh, so as Greece has been able to attract significant uh, FDI, it was not from China. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't sense that in any way, shape, or form the Greek economy is overly reliant or dependent uh, on Chinese investment. And at the end of the day, you know, the port is being regulated uh, by, the, uh, by the Greek um, uh, authorities. And I don't sense sort of any, uh, any strategic threat uh, by the, the presence of, of China, again, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in one of in our, in our largest port. But... Um, uh, uh, we are a country that uh, respects international agreements. This deal was done before we came into power, and we have to respect it. Well, thank you for that. Let me ask one last uh, uh, question in terms of security in your region and then open it up to questions from others in the room. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you are at a difficult spot in the crossroads of the world. Uh, there at the southern flank, and it was surprising to many that uh, Gaza was not on the agenda as uh, announced by the Secretary General of NATO. Uh, Greece knows full well the fallout of conflicts in the wider region, having felt the weight of the migration flows from Syria and Afghanistan. As this uh, conflict plays out uh, in Israel and Gaza, what are your thoughts on the conversation that should be taking place here in Washington about that and how to address that conflict and what is uh, really a growing humanitarian crisis? Well, first of all, let me point out that Greece sits on the external borders of the European Union, so you're right to point out it has felt uh, the migration uh, uh, pressure very, very intensely over the past uh, uh, decade. Uh, and we've seen various aspects of the migration uh, problem. We've seen desperate people uh, you know, fleeing war and persecution uh, in search of uh, safety and fully entitled to international protection. We've seen economic migrants you know, looking um, uh, for you know, a better future in, uh, in Europe. We've seen countries instrumentalize migration uh, to put geopolitical pressure on Greece and, and Europe. This is what happened on the Greek-Turkish border. Uh, in March 2020. Thank God it was not um, um, uh, uh, repeated. Uh, uh, and um, uh, we've um, uh, been able, I think, to manage this very, very complex problem in a, in, in a tough but, but fair uh, uh, manner. And uh, we've made it very, very uh, clear, and this is also the position of the European Union, that it is not up to the smugglers uh, to decide who enters um, uh, uh, Europe. It's up to the sovereign governments to, to charter um, uh, their uh, policies when it comes to, um, uh, to migration. We have a new pact now on migration and asylum, which was voted uh, by the European institutions, which is in the process uh, of being um, uh, implemented. Uh, and at the same time, 
we fully, fully recognize that firm management of our borders needs to go hand in hand with offering legal pathways um, to, um, for migration uh, in an organized and safe manner. Uh, so we need both sort of a, if you want to use the analogy, a big fence and a big door. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I think this policy cannot be balanced and will not work. And look at a country such as Greece, which is you know, coming out of the crisis. We are already in need of, uh, of for example, uh, agricultural workers. So we've done a deal with, uh, with Egypt. And uh, um, uh, we want to bring in sort of Egyptians on long-term work permits. But they should come, you know, properly and safely, and not necessarily jump on a uh, on a boat and pay an obscene amount of money to a smuggler um, uh, to bring them to, um, you know, a Greek island uh, uh, in a, in, a, in a journey that is extremely uh, perilous. Now, coming to to the question uh, uh, of the Middle East and Gaza, I mean, we've been very outspoken on this issue. We need, uh, you know, permanent ceasefire as quickly uh, as possible. The situation in, in Gaza is extremely, extremely um, um, problematic. Uh, uh, we've made our position as, as Europe you know, very, very uh, clear. And I do think that uh, this is uh, a position that also eventually serves the long-term strategic interests, not just of the Palestinians, but also of Israel. And I think this is something that we need to communicate you know, very, very um, uh, firmly, and we've had too many false starts when it comes to this ceasefire, but every day that goes by, we have innocent loss of life uh, in a situation which is becoming more and more um, uh, dramatic in spite of the fact that we've had more aid coming into Gaza. The situation is very, very ugly. And of course, the more this, uh, this, this, this war goes on, the greater the likelihood that you may have uh, an explosion on the northern front. And if Lebanon were to collapse, then you're talking about a completely different picture when it comes to um, uh, uh, refugees. Mm. <clears throat> and we don't want to go through this, uh, uh, this another refugee uh, crisis like the one we had to manage back in 2015. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Understandable. Well, th thank you for that. Let's open it up to conversation here in the room. Let's start with some questions. I want to remind you that this is on the record. Um, Nick. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome, Mr. Prime Minister. If I may just shift to a bi the bilateral relationship between Greece and the United States. It's an all-time high. We hear it on both sides of the aisles. However, can you just tell us, even in a good relationship, is there something more that we can imp you can improve on or something more that you would like from the United States the United States wants from you? How would you describe that area of your relationship today? Well, thank you for your question, Nick. Um, yes, I think it's correct to uh, point out that the relationship is at an all-time uh, high, and I'm glad to take some, some credit uh, for this in terms of the policies that we have implemented over the past uh, five years. Uh, this is a strong and, and, and profound relationship, and for me, my opportunity to address uh, the joint session of, uh, uh, of Congress uh, um, uh, back in 2022 was a sort of uh, a very, very important moment, and I think also very important for the Greek-American community uh, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, on the defense and military side, we're doing much together, and uh, um, we can always do um, uh, more uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that uh, you know, Greece uh, has access both to excess defense articles uh, but also to modern weapon systems. Again, let me point out that it's, it's never in Greece's uh, interest uh, to enter into an arms race with, uh, with anyone, but we do want and we insist on having credible deterrence. Uh, so we place emphasis on quality uh, uh, over, uh, uh, over quantity, and uh, that is also one of the reasons why we, uh, we took the decision um, uh, to purchase uh, F-35 um, jets uh, uh, from the U.S., and I'm looking towards completing the necessary procedures uh, as, um, uh, as quickly as possible. But I think this is a relationship that has many dimensions. You know, in the past, we've always focused uh, a lot on, uh, on geopolitics. I also want to highlight the economic aspect of the relationship, the fact that we have significantly more foreign direct investment from the U.S., um, uh, coming into uh, into Greece uh, as the economy 
uh, is growing. Uh, more U.S. capital is being deployed in Greece. More tech companies are interested uh, in investing in Greece. And I think this is uh, an aspect of the relationship that we can certainly uh, still, uh, still work on. Greece is a different country in 2024 compared to the country it was in 2019. But because we went through this, uh, this 10-year crisis, there is still a legacy of uh, wrong perceptions about where Greece is today. And we can always work on making sure that we um, uh, change uh, uh, that and point to all the necessary uh, data to, to confirm the fact that this is really a good time to uh, invest uh, uh, in, in Greece. Uh, and of course, you know, the strength between our uh, our communities and the Greek American community being a, a you know a real um, a bridge between uh, the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and and Greece uh, uh, and uh, you know cherishing and strengthening um, uh, those uh, those ties. This is an issue I take uh, great importance when I, for example, look at the, the possibility of technology now for language learning and what we can do more in terms of making sure that uh, the younger generation, the next generation. Uh, uh, of Greek Americans stay connected uh, to Greece. Uh, uh, this is an area where we clearly uh, can do um, uh, much more together. Thank you. Um, Mike. Uh, Mike Froman, Council on Foreign Relations. I just wanted to build on your comment on uh, the economy, Mr. Prime Minister. Greece went from being really quite a basket case with several rounds of crisis to returning to investment grade, growing faster than the rest of Europe. And you've pursued very difficult economic reforms that would generally be considered unpopular while being reelected, maintaining your popularity. Most employers here have a hard time getting employees back two or three days a week, including the US government. You've just gone to a six day work week. Um, what's the secret of how you well, succeed in difficult economic reforms while maintaining political support? Any advice to your fellow European leaders who seem to be having some difficulty in that area or to folks here in the United States? Well, first of all, I'm going to clarify that we're not on a six-day work week. <laughs> I may be on a seven-day work week as, pri as, 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 as prime minister, but that is, that is not true. What we have done, and just to clarify that, is uh, we've given the possibility to those companies that actually work 24-7 um, uh, to um, uh, uh, have their employees work for a six day if they choose to do so and pay them much better uh, if, they, if they actually want to work for, um, uh, for a six day. But actually making sure that you have a, a labor market that is uh, uh, flexible uh, and that takes into account the sort of new priorities of work-life balance is, I think, an important component also of our economic uh, success. So we actually also have a four-day work week for those because we respect the 40 hours per week for those who actually want to work 10 hours for four days. And if they can find an arrangement with their employers, they can actually um, um, do that. But coming back to um, your, uh, your question, yes, we have been unapologetic in terms of trying to govern from the political center. And I think this has been, uh, uh, to a great extent, the success uh, of, uh, of our party, uh, winning uh, uh, in 2019, winning again with an increased share of the vote in uh, in, in 2023. Uh, we are a center-right party that focuses on delivering um, uh, results, uh, uh, fiscally prudent because we have to be, um, uh, but also very much focused on, uh, on growth. Uh, very much uh, when it comes to our foreign policies, uh, promoting what I call responsible uh, patriotism, which means strengthening the position uh, of the country and making sure that we build strong alliances, and I would say relatively socially progressive when it comes to uh, uh, when, when it comes to um, uh, social issues. So I think this has delivered for our party a you know a strong uh, majority, uh, and we're one of those countries that currently does not have any real political issues because we have a strong parliamentary majority, still three years in our term, and a very clear um, roadmap in terms of the reforms that we want to, to implement. But at the end of the day, I think the reason why we got reelected was very simple. We did what we told people we would do. We came into power in 2019 telling them we would want to cut taxes and bring the country back to uh, a, a growth path, uh, path. We want to improve public services, digitize um, uh, the state, uh, and make sure that Greece punches again above its weight when it comes to international affairs. And we did those things. And now, the beginning of our second term, we want to build upon uh, this um, progress, address more complicated 
uh, issues when it comes to public services, you know, really improving our healthcare system, making structural reforms to our justice system because it simply takes too long in Greece to get to any judicial decision uh, uh, and at the same time make sure that we build upon this positive economic momentum. We need to catch up with Europe. And the only way to catch up with Europe is to see grow for a long period of time much faster than the rest of the Eurozone. This is what the markets seem to believe that we're able to do. So we want to make sure that at the beginning of our second term, we double down on all these reforms that will uh, you know, maintain us on this uh, positive track. And yes, sometimes some of these reforms uh, uh, are not necessarily uh, all, uh, all popular, but you know, it's a price you have to, uh, to pay in, uh, uh, in, in politics. And of course, if you want to do difficult reforms, it also makes sense to do them at the beginning of your term and not at the end. It seems to me that this is smart, uh, smart politics. Uh, and this is exactly what we have been doing, because some of the reforms we have implemented were politically complicated. But so far, so, so, far, so good. Congratulations on the success. We're going to take one question here from our online viewers. Nope, oh, I'm told, nope. We're going to take maybe the gentleman in the blue tie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back to Washington, D.C., Mr. Prime Minister. And since I trumped uh, the author of the East Mediterranean uh, Security and Energy Partnership Act, you alluded to the link when you were talking about selling gas to Ukraine between security and energy. You also, uh, then Special Representative for Climate Change, John Kerry, called you the star of COP28. You have been able to move ahead on natural gas and renewables while cutting way below, or committing to cutting way below the Paris uh, Accord. Uh, how, how are you managing your own energy security with your ambitious climate goals? And also, can you just give us a little preview? What do you think are the most exciting renewable projects in the region? Because Greece is leading on that. And how can that uh, help with security? Well, energy has been a very complex uh, uh, topic, not just for Greece, but also for Europe. And I think we, we realized during the height of the Ukrainian war the, the price that we had to pay for being too dependent on Russian gas. And I think we moved away from Russian gas, not completely, but very, very quickly. Uh, and it was necessary to do that both for geopolitical but also for, uh, for economic reasons. Now, if you look at Greece's energy mix, uh, 15 years ago, 70% of our electricity production was coal. Uh, now it's 5%. So we moved away from coal almost completely. Uh, today, 55% of our electricity production is renewables, wind, solar, and, uh, and hydro. Uh, and uh, basically, the rest is, uh, is, is natural uh, gas. Uh, and our intention is to push up renewable penetration as much as we can. And I stress as much as we can, because uh, when you produce so much electricity from renewables, you're beginning to face the real problems of what it means to deal with significant amount of electricity produced from intermittent um, um, uh, sources. So our emphasis uh, is, is very much in terms of you know, adding renewables, uh, but in a way that balances uh, the, the system, focusing on storage. Uh, and, and in our case, it's not just batteries, but also pump storage. I'm a big believer in, uh, in pump storage. And we, because we have big dams historically, Hydro serves the purpose, not just of producing electricity, but also being essentially a, a big battery and focusing on interconnections. Interconnections in Europe are going to be absolutely critical to balance the system. If we want to have more renewables, we need more uh, uh, interconnections. And this is not just uh, interconnections to our neighbors, but also big interconnections that, for example, can connect the wind that the North Sea produces you know, in the winter with the sun that the Mediterranean can produce. Uh, in, in the summer. And of course, there's also the additional chapter of how we can connect to, uh, to North Africa, the big challenges of offshore wind, uh, which again is opening up new, um, uh, uh, new possibilities. But uh, at the end of the day, we will always need baseload 
um, uh, electricity production, and in the short to medium term, in the case of Greece, this is going to be gas. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, whether it's piped gas, but in particular, uh, LNG gas. That is why we need more um, uh, entry points for uh, um, uh, uh, regasifying the uh, the LNG. Uh, and uh, of course, we have not uh, abandoned our own hydrocarbon. Uh, exploration. Um, uh, uh, ExxonMobil is currently uh, engaged in very active uh, uh, research uh, southwest of uh, Peloponnesus and, uh, and Crete. We, again, this would be a plus for us. Um, uh, if it were to happen, you know, uh, so much the better. I think we're pushing the envelope in terms of, uh, of time to, to make these, um, uh, to, to see if there's anything worthwhile to commercially exploit, but I think we, have, we at least have an obligation before we take that decision to know if there are any um, uh, sort of significant uh, gas reserves sitting um, uh, within our um, uh, exclusive um, uh, economic zone, and this is uh, what uh, we're going to be doing. But let me make a broader uh, uh, point uh, uh, about the green transition. The green transition has been a flagship project for, uh, for Europe. And indeed, it is very noble that Europe has, has been so, um, uh, so aggressive in terms of setting targets regarding climate neutrality for 2050, but we only account for 15% you know, of, you know, of, of, of global emissions. And we're beginning to realize that the, global, the green transition costs a lot of money and that it cannot happen at the expense of our businesses, our citizens, our farmers. Um, so I think the we will look at issues regarding the pace of how quickly this transition actually takes place and the financing tools that we need in order to actually make it happen. Now, when it comes to finance, we actually did something very important during the height of COVID in 2020. We raised 750 billion euros for, um, through European borrowing. For the first time, we issued uh, a new sort of, we created a new instrument, and this is money that is used to help us with the green and the digital transition, um, uh, as well as with issues related, regarding competitiveness. So for Greece, this is 36 billion euros uh, over five years in grants and loans. It's a lot of money. For example, the pump one of the pump storage projects we, uh, I, I talked to you about is funded from this uh, facility. So we need not just private, but also public money to finance this uh, transition. We're going to have to take the last question. I uh, give it to the gentleman there. Uh, with a blue shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ted Deutsch from AJC. Mr. Prime Minister, good to see you again. Uh, Ambassador, you referenced earlier uh, the surprise that Gaza conflict was not on the agenda here. And I, I would just, um, I wanted to pull out from there. Obviously, as the administration, as the president regularly points out, the Gaza conflict has started when Iranian-backed Hamas terrorists uh, conducted this horrific terror attack and could end when they return the hostages and lay down their arms. In the north, we rightfully worry about what could happen as a result of uh, still the almost daily attacks from Iranian-backed Hezbollah. There was talk of maritime, and it's the Iranian-backed Houthis. Uh, and then in what is on the agenda here, it's Iran that is, that is providing drones and missiles to Russia to use in Ukraine. So I, I would just ask the question differently. Are, are you surprised that Iran is not firmly on the agenda? And then add to that, of course, their ongoing nuclear program, which will impact not just the Middle East, but the entire region, given their threats just recently to Cyprus. Yeah, as well. I think, thank you Ted, for pointing this out, because we've, uh, we've actually had, we did not talk at all about Cyprus. Uh, and I do want to, to make this very, very um, um, quick point. Uh, it's going to be 50 years uh, on um, July 20th since the Turkish invasion and occupation of Cyprus. And this issue has still not been resolved. And the only way to resolve it is to stick to the framework of the decisions taken by the United Nations. Um, uh, uh, Security uh, Council. Uh, so I just want to remember um, that uh, and remind the audience uh, that uh, 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 there's still a, you know, a European country that is you know, partially 
um, occupied. Uh, uh, now, when it comes, uh, and of course, we saw threats uh, against Cyprus, which are completely unacceptable and completely condemnable, and this is actually the, for the reaction of Cyprus, Greece, the European Union, uh, uh, the US. Uh, uh, we're concerned about the, you know, the re you know, those, those regional um, uh, troublemakers. I'm sure that the topic, you know, uh, the, the topic will come up uh, in uh, uh, our discussions. And again, we mentioned the Houthis. Again, uh, this this is an issue for reasons which I explained previously, which is again of, of, of great uh, uh, concern uh, to us. Uh, but again, if we could, in the line of what you said, have an agreement, return of hostages ceasefire, and uh, at least uh, not giving others the sort of excuse that they were looking for to continue um, uh, you know, war by proxy, I think it would only be good if that, uh, if, if that were, to, um, uh, were to happen you know, sooner uh, rather than later. And we'll do our best um, uh, to, to contribute towards that goal. Thank you. We'll have to leave it there. I want to remind you that the transcript and video will be on the Council of Foreign Relations link. Mr. Prime Minister, we wish you great success, uh, that of you and the other leaders here in Washington. Courage, inspiration, and good insight as you deal with these global challenges over the next few well, days. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me.